to each of these churches, a marvelous promise is given to them that overcome, to the overcomers, and then some kind of promise is given to each, to each church. Now, my, my assignment, my text, is from chapter 2, verse 7. This is the promise given to the overcomers in the church at Ephesus, to the one or to the ones who overcome I will give, and some, some translations say, give the right. I will give, or I will grant, or I will give the right to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Overcomers are promised the right, or the privilege, or the gift of eating from the tree of life. One of the oldest pieces of literature that we have in the world today is a story called the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's a story that was written in ancient Sumer, which, by the way, was the same civilization that Abram was called out of to go to Canaan. One of the first great civilizations in history was called Sumer. And this story from ancient Sumer is about a king whose name was Gilgamesh, an incredibly powerful ruler, yet he was afraid of facing his own death. And so he goes out in search of immortality. He is told about a plant that can grant eternal life. And so he searches for this plant and he finds it. And he's preparing to take it back to his city, but while he's asleep at night, a snake steals it from him while he is sleeping. Hmm. And so Gilgamesh goes back to his city empty-handed, but reconciled to the fact that he is mortal and believing that the only way he can really achieve some kind of immortality is by building up his city as a monument to himself. That's a little secular story about eternal life and the search for eternal life. Now, when we read God's book, in the opening chapters, we read about the tree of life there in the Garden of Eden. Man originally had access to immortality and would have lived forever there in the Garden of Eden. But then a serpent comes along and successfully tempts the man and the woman to sin by eating from the forbidden tree. And when they do that, access to the tree of life is blocked. The man and his wife are expelled from the paradise of God. And the tree of life is lost to humanity. That is, until we read the very final chapters of the Bible. And in the book of Revelation, guess what? The tree of life is back. It returns at the end of the book. And so the tree of life acts as bookends for the biblical story. The mega narrative or the overarching story of scripture moves with remarkable unity from creation to new creation with the tree of life as the central image of man's fall and redemption. So when we talk about the tree of life, we're touching on one of the major nerve centers of Scripture. What was lost in Adam is regained in Christ and with an even greater glory. The second Adam does the exact opposite of the first Adam, thereby undoing what the first Adam did and giving us access once again to the paradise of God and the tree of life. Amen. The tree of life, you see, is the source of eternal life. And let's take a moment to really understand what we mean when we use the word eternal. Eternal life. What, what kind of life is eternal life? Not just life, but eternal life. What, what do we mean when we use the word eternal? Eternal. Well, first of all, Eternal does not mean a long, long, not long, long time. That's not what it means. In fact, the word eternal has nothing to do with a quantity of something. 
like a lot of time. So when we, usually when we use the word in the English language today, when we say like, I took my car to the shop and the mechanic took an eternity to get it fixed. We're, we're using that term quantitatively. That is a lot of something. It took a lot of time is what we're saying to get my car fixed. But when we read about eternal, eternal something in the Bible, eternal life, it doesn't mean just a lot of time. It means something else. Uh, eternal is a quality. It's not a quantity. It's describing the essence of something, not just a lot of something. When we use this word, when, when the scripture uses this word, we should always connect it to God himself. You see, because God is really the only being who can claim eternality. God is the great I am, or the one who is self-existing. Everyone and everything else had a beginning. Everyone and everything else depends on another source outside of itself to exist, but God is dependent on no other source for his life. God just is. One, one, the, one modern theologian said that God is the ground of all being. That is, everything that has its being came from God. But God himself just is. Everything exists, everything else exists, because God has willed it to exist. So when we talk about eternal life, we're talking about God life. We're talking about a God kind of life. We're talking about a divine life. And so the tree of life is a picture of God sharing his own life with man. God's original purpose was to give or share eternal life with mankind. That's why the tree of life was planted there in the Garden of Eden. Now, let's just understand that eternal life does not come from a tree. Eternal life comes from God. If we get eternal life from a tree, it's only because God put the life there. But this goes back to God himself. God's the source of eternal life. This teaches us that eternal life is not something that is in us already by nature. It is something that must be taken in from outside of ourselves. You know, the same is true with sustaining your biological life. The life of your body. See, your body doesn't have eternal life. It has life. It's, bi it's biological life, not eternal life. But even your biological life has to be sustained by taking in something from outside yourself. We just got done doing it. Probably too much of it just a moment ago. See, we have to take in food from outside of ourselves just to sustain the biological lives we have. Well, that's just a little image of this principle of eternal life. You don't have eternal life when you're born. You have to be born again to get it. See, it, ha it has to come from outside yourself. But see, God, see, tree of life. God planted that tree of life there in Eden. God provides what we need. Whatever need we have, whether it be something you need in the physical body, whether it be something in the spiritual realm, this is what the Bible's teaching us. Everything you need, God provides. It comes from God. You got to get it from God. You got to go. You got to go to God to get what you really need. And if you don't, you won't have it. You won't have it at all. The ultimate issue for a dying race is how to get access to eternal life. Is there a way back to the tree of life? This is something that mankind has been seeking since the writing of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And even today, with all of our technological and scientific and medical achievements, there's still no cure that we have found for death. But the gospel of Christ and the scriptures hold out the hope of eternal life. There is a way to get access to the tree of life. And that's the promise that was given by Jesus himself to the Christians there in Ephesus. You can have access to the tree of life 
but there are a few conditions. There are a few conditions. First of all, first condition is someone has to give you access. Yes, there is a way back to the tree of life, but there's only one person who can get you there. Access to the tree of life is granted only by Jesus. Eternal life is not something you can find on your own. It's certainly not something you can earn. It is Jesus himself who gives this access to the tree of life. And he gives it, he grants it. In other words, it's a gift. It's the gift of eternal life. Not not a payment for your good deeds. It's a gift. Jesus wants to give this. But you've got to get it from him. You can't get it from any other, from any other source. I should, I should say this too. You can't get eternal life from the church. The church does not dispense eternal life. Even though there are theological systems that have been concocted that basically say that. No. We get eternal life from Jesus. You got to go to Jesus. Now it just so happens that if you want to meet Jesus, you do have to go to his church. But, but, but we don't, see, the church doesn't have eternal life over here and, and we'll dole it out, you know, if people come and tithe or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, be, if you become a member of our church, yeah, we might give you a little bit of our eternal life. No, that's not how it works. It comes from Jesus. Amen. Now, Ephesus is given this promise. The church at Ephesus was given the promise that you can eat from the tree of life. And I think they needed to know this little detail about the gospel. Why did Ephesus need to know about the tree of life that is the access, the access to which is only granted by Jesus? Here's why I think they needed to know that. Because their relationship to Jesus was shaky. Yeah. Remember this? Remember what Brother Given ministered on? They had lost or forsaken, and that's why they lost it, by the way. Brother Given pointed this out. They had forsaken their first love. That's why they lost it. And they didn't just lose it like Oh, I lost my car keys. Where did I put my car keys? No, they forsook something. But the result of that was that they had lost as a result. Their first love for Jesus himself. Now, if Jesus is the one who gives access to the tree of life, then the church needs to make sure her relationship with Christ is strong. Do you see that connection there? If Jesus, if Jesus can give access to the tree of life, then he can also deny access to the tree of life. That's the implication. Not everyone's going to eat of the tree of life. Some, and you read the end of Revelation, this becomes very clear. Some people are going to be expelled from the paradise of God forever. Now in the account of man's fall in Eden, when the way to the tree of life is blocked, very little is said in the rest of the Old Testament about eternal life. The way back to the tree of life was not opened under the law of Moses. It was not until Jesus came that eternal life is opened up to us and made available. Christ came into the world to destroy death and bring life and immortality to light through the gospel. That's 2 Timothy 1 verse 10. The only hope we have of overcoming death is through that member of the human race who himself overcame death by his resurrection from the dead. Just as death came through a man, eternal life has come through a man. And the only way we can have this eternal life is by being in spiritual union with Christ and being raised to life with him. That, by the way, is depicted in our baptism, Romans 6. In other words, Jesus really is himself the tree of life. He is the bread that came down from heaven to give life to the world. John 6, 33 to 35. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty five. 25. If we have Jesus, we have life. If we don't have Jesus, we don't have life. That's 1 John 5, 11 and 12. It's really that simple. It can't be any more clear. So God has made eternal life accessible to us in Jesus. Praise God. For us to have access to this life, the Son of God had to come into the world as a man. 
The incarnation, you see, was not done just for show. There was a reason for it. If humanity was to share in the life of God, then God had to share in our humanity. Jesus did not just come to show us the way to the tree of life, but to be the tree of life himself. When Jesus said things like, I am the bread of life, or I am the resurrection and the life, he is doing nothing less than claiming to be God. Only God has eternal life and can be the source of life for us. So by claiming to be that source, Jesus is claiming to be divine himself, not merely someone who is a guide to the divine. Although he is that too. This is what separates Jesus from all other religious leaders or moral teachers in history. No other religious figure in history has even made the claim to actually be the source of eternal life. Most religious leaders will say, I can show you the way. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father <coughs> except through me, John 14, 6. So Jesus is the exclusive source of life, of eternal life from God. Now that isn't difficult for us to understand. It's not difficult for us to understand what Jesus said in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's not a hard text to interpret. The difficulty for many people in our age is in the exclusivity of that claim. Jesus claimed to be the only way to God, the only source of eternal life. And that's what gives many modern people a lot of trouble today. But that's something we can either believe or reject. You can believe that or you can disbelieve that. There really isn't any other option. Now, when Christians believe that Jesus is the only way, we have some good reasons for believing that about Jesus. Who else has done the things that Jesus did? Who else can say, as he says in Revelation 1.18, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Who else can say that? Jesus has some impressive credentials that prove he is the source of eternal life. He is the only person to have ever risen from the dead under his own power. Who else has done that? Now, here's the way I think about it. If, the, if there's a man who can conquer death, that must be the guy who's going to give eternal life. It's a very wise thing to find the man who defeated death and just go with him. Just do what he says to do. That's probably a safe bet. The man who is offering us eternal life and access to the tree of life has risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, and has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. The man with all authority is going to give us access to the tree of life. You remember when Joseph was made the ruler of all Egypt, he began to store up the grain of Egypt during the years of plenty. So when the years of famine came and the people ran out of grain and were going to die, they went to the Pharaoh who simply said, this is Genesis 41, 55, go to Joseph, what he says to do, do. This is what God is saying to a dying race. If you want to live, go to my son Amen. and do what he tells you to do. Amen. You see, this is the time to be reconciled to the man who can give you access to the tree of life. You need to be his friend. And if you're not, you need to be reconciled to him. Eventually, everyone will either be invited in or shut out forever from the presence of the one who is life. And our lives in this world are hanging between these two alternatives. In fact, the only real purpose for this life is to introduce us to eternity, which can either be filled with life or filled with death. The second condition, there's this promise, you can have access to the tree of life, but you can only get it from Jesus. Only he can grant access. The second condition is that you're only going to find the tree of life in the new creation. 
the, the, way, the way to the tree of life has been forever blocked in this world. The tree of life isn't here. It's in the paradise of God. Which is, in other words, it's in the new heavens and the new earth, yeah. or the new creation. Now, why did God block the way to the tree of life? What if man had been able to eat of the tree of life after he had sinned? And, and what if he had done that and then had been able to live forever in a fallen, alienated state? The results. The results would have been horrible. Yes, right. That's why. That's why there's a little conversation in the Godhead. There in Genesis, he says, "Lest he take out his hand and eat from the tree of life and live forever." And the sentence isn't even finished. The results are too horrible to think about. What a merciful God! Yes. What a merciful, loving God! Amen. I I can't let him eat from the tree of life because that's that's. I can't let them live forever in a fallen world. Yeah. See, in, in some sense, death is a mercy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Amen. What's that? There, isn't there an old song, I would not live always? I, I don't want to live forever in this right. fallen world. That's right. We recognize that there are some states in which death is to be preferred to life. When someone is suffering intensely, we long for death to end the suffering. There are some states a person could be in where they can enjoy no quality of life. They are biologically alive, but they are really, they cannot really live. They cannot enjoy life the way it was meant to be lived, and their, their body becomes like a living death. Now, th that is true in a sense for the entire human race. When sin entered the world, there was alienation from God. We should always understand sin as a state, not just the individual transgressions that we commit. Sin is more than just the individual transgressions yes. that we commit. Sin is a state. It's a state of alienation yeah. from God. And man was not made to live that way. Right. We were not made to live apart from God. Our, our lives are never really right without God. Amen. How can we really live apart from the one who created us to be with him? That's why we were created, for God. So you see, death follows sin just as naturally as night follows the day. The wages of sin is death. From one perspective, death was a divine mercy, but from another perspective, it was also a divine judgment. It was a judgment that amounted to a limitation being placed upon sinful mankind. We cannot even imagine what sinners would begin to do if they knew they could never die. The longer lifespans of the antediluvian world may have also contributed to the ever-increasing wickedness of the world leading up to the flood. Yeah. How wicked would men become if they had hundreds and hundreds of years to develop their wickedness? So just as God has placed boundaries for the sea, he has also placed boundaries on the lifespan of sinful man. Wicked men may seem to flourish for a time, and they boast in their strength and in their accomplishments, yet their feet are placed in slippery places, and death finds them at last. That's why you should never envy the temporary prosperity of the wicked. You can, you can read more in Psalm 73. All flesh, Isaiah said, is grass. Why? Because God has made it so. The way to the tree of life is not open to sinful man. The entire order of creation was cursed in Adam, and it has been subjected to futility by the creator himself in view of making a new creation. Until the new creation is ready, this old creation will remain in a state of frustration. And there is no amount of human ingenuity or science or progress that will change God's decree of death that has settled over this world. We must wait and hope for the world to come. So in the meantime, pain 
and suffering and death will be the norm for life under the sun. Now, pain is not the will of God for man, but it is used by God to teach man about the consequences of alienation. God allows us to hurt, not because he just wants us to hurt, but because he wants us to seek out the reason for the hurt, which would eventually lead us to God himself. In other words, God intends to frustrate human life he intends to frustrate all of our efforts to save ourselves so that we have to go to him. Yeah. If there's going to be a way of salvation, it's got to come from God. Yeah. Amen. Now, pain can drive us to the Lord and make us long for the salvation that only he can provide. C.S. Lewis said that we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world, end quote. Now, when speaking to believers, though, Paul said, our suffering in this present world are birth pains. The world is groaning in the pains of childbirth. That means there's hope. That means that there is a new creation about to be born. Amen. So you see, brothers and sisters, how foolish and futile it is to try to find satisfaction and happiness in a world like ours. The tree of life isn't here. Yeah. That's right. Amen. Even if you were to get everything you ever wanted in life, and nobody does, but even if you were, you wouldn't be able to keep it because you'd die. Yeah. Eventually. We live in a world where there are thieves and stock market crashes and tornadoes, and disease, and wars, and traffic accidents, and political corruption. Yeah. How, in, how does anyone really get everything they want in a world like that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a grave mistake to fall in love with the things of this world because these things are in a state of passing away. Love those things too much and your heart will be forever broken. The only people who will not be ultimately disappointed are those who love what is eternal. That's why John said, love not the world. The only people who are going to live forever are the people who do the will of God. So the tree of life belongs to the new creation. It's in the paradise of God. Okay? You can't go to California and eat the tree of life or Africa and eat the tree of life. See what I'm saying? It's, it's not here, it, but it's going to be there in the new creation, in the paradise of God, not in this world. This means that the only people who will eat of the tree of life are those who make it into the new creation. Not everybody's going to make it there. We know this is the case because the Bible says the present heavens and earth are being reserved for the destruction of fire. That's 2 Peter 3.10. Everything in this present world, including people, are going to pass through the fires of God's judgment. And some things and some people will not make it through that ordeal. There's a great separation coming. The sheep are going to be separated from the goats. The wheat are going to be separated from the tares, which Jesus said are going to be burned. Everything that is incompatible with the new creation will be thrown onto that great cosmic trash heap that the book of Revelation calls the lake of fire. That fire will never be quenched. There are some things and some people who belong to this present evil world. A person who belongs to this world has developed a love or an affection or an affinity with those things that are opposed to God and his will. These people will not only be excluded, these people and these things will not only be excluded from the new creation because they would defile it, but even if even if people who belonged to this world were allowed to enter that world, they'd never be happy anyway. There's nothing there they want. Why would you want to eat from the tree of life if the fruit of that tree is distasteful to you and you loathe every bite? So if we are going to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, we must become adapted to that environment. This is the time to get adapted to the new creation that's coming. The tree of life is an acquired taste. There are certain things in nature 
that are made to live in a particular environment and cannot live in any other place. Some animals live underwater. Other animals cannot live underwater. Some plants can grow in a dry and arid desert where other plants would only die. You see what I'm saying? If, if we're going to make it into the new creation, we must become adapted to that environment. And these adaptations take place in this world. If you're not adapted here, you won't be there. That's why God's children are aliens and strangers in this world. We've been made for another world. So be careful what kind of attachments you develop. Be careful what kind of affections and desires you make in this world. Some of those desires and affections and attachments cannot carry over into the world to come. And if you are not compatible with the new creation, you will not enter it. Jesus said you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. There's one final condition in this promise. Jesus said, I'll grant you the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, but only the overcomers. Isn't that what it says? Yeah. The overcomers. Yeah. Those who overcome will eat of the tree of life. What must we overcome to eat of the tree of life? You know, most people who read the book of Revelation come away scared. And that's probably not a mature, uh, informed reaction to the overall message of Revelation, but it's not a bad place to start. There are some scary images in Revelation that should make us stop and take notice. The first really scary image is that of the dragon. Now, that's an image, of course, of Satan. Here is the great enemy of God and mankind unmasked and revealed as the powerful and dangerous adversary that he really is. He really is a dragon. He's, a, he's ultimately a frustrated and a defeated enemy, but he's also a relentless enemy who doesn't give up easily. And so to help him wage his cosmic war against God and his people in the earth, Satan hires three employees. These are all, this is all in Revelation. There's the first beast, the second beast, which is also known as the false prophet, and the prostitute, also called Babylon the Great. Satan's three employees. The meaning of these images would, would, would need another message. It's enough to know that they work for the devil. Yes. Yes. These are the forces of darkness arrayed against God's people in the world. These are the enemies we must overcome if we are to eat of the tree of life. Amen. It sounds like an impossible task. But we already know we're in a spiritual battle against the forces of darkness for which we need spiritual armor and weaponry. Revelation is not telling us anything exactly new, but the enemies of God and his people are being unmasked or revealed in all of their hideous glory. We need to know the true nature of our enemies because they will never reveal the truth about themselves willingly. Satan and his workers work by deception and stealth. And so things in this world are simply not what they seem. Satan is the god or the ruler of this world system, and he blinds the eyes of people. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Most people don't even know Satan is there until he has slithered into their lives. He doesn't have to use brute force and obvious wickedness to do his work. Satan can ensnare and tempt with small pleasures that seem harmless and that take us down a broad and easy path to hell. Satan is a master counterfeiter who offers cheap substitutes for real spiritual life. He even has his own religions and he offers his own false gods to worship. Some of these wear the name Christian. Most of Satan's lies make us think only of what we can have here and now. Don't wait for the don't wait for that tree of life in the paradise of God. Live your life now. See, that's Satan's message. Instead of waiting on God and his good gifts, Satan wants us to take for ourselves what we can get here and now in this world. That's how he tempted Adam and Eve. His lies and temptations never really change, but are just repackaged for each new generation. So the book of Revelation says to get to the tree of life, you've got to get past all of Satan's deceptions. Amen. Now, how are we going to do that? How do we overcome the devil? How, do we, how can we take on the dragon and win? Satan has already demonstrated that he, he can dupe even the very best members of the human race. But there is one man, 
Satan was not able to defeat. Satan tried to tempt him. This man said no. Satan tried to kill him. He rose from the dead. Jesus has already overcome. The lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. Revelation 5 verse 5. And so Christ's victory is becoming our victory. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Revelation 12, 11. I think this is the central message of the entire book of Revelation, incidentally. Christ has won the victory and he, he won it on earth, but now he's ascended into heaven and he's reigning. So if you're on his side, you win. That's, that's really the message of the book of Revelation. Now, some people will ask, if that's true, why are, still, why are things still the way they are? I mean, the world's still a pretty dep depressing place. The world is still a pretty evil place, and the existence of evil and why bad things happen is a major stumbling block to the faith of many people. But the scriptures clear this up for us. The scriptures prophesy that the Christ would reign in the midst of his enemies. Yes. Psalm 110, yes. until, until yes. his enemies are made into his footstool. Yes. The book of Revelation promises that this will in fact happen, and then those who are with Christ will eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Yes. You see, the kingdom of God has come, but it's still coming when it comes in its fullness, we will eat of the tree of life. It doesn't look like the church is overcoming right now. If you look at those seven churches, some of, those, some of them didn't look like they were overcoming. Sometimes it looks like the world is overcoming the saints. Sometimes the world even kills the people of God. But the saints are going to reign with Christ. This thing isn't over yet, and Jesus is going to have the last word so this is our hope that motivates us to stay in the race and to keep fighting the good fight of faith. That's why this promise is given to the church at Ephesus. If you overcome, you'll get to eat of the tree of life. Keep running. Yes. Keep fighting. Yes. Yeah. Now you do have to run yeah. and you do have to fight yeah. in order to overcome and be granted access to the tree of life. But the promise is if we, if we run, we win. If we fight, we win. Not because we're such great runners and we're such great fighters. No, because he's already blazed a trail for us. There is a prize and it is access to the tree of life. So do whatever it takes to make it into the new creation where the tree of life is growing there by the river of life. Whatever it takes to get there, you do it. It's worth it. Whatever you have to give up, you give it up. Whatever you have to suffer for Jesus, you suffer for Jesus because this is what's waiting for us. The tree of life. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. How do we overcome and get to the tree of life? We overcome by faith in the one who has already overcome the world. And someday, brethren, our victory is going to be complete. You see, there's more to salvation than what you have experienced. Someday you're going to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. In the world to come, it's waiting for us there. The tree of life. Jesus said in John 17, 3, eternal life is knowing God and the one that God has sent. Now, if eternal life is knowing God, then eating from the tree of life will be to finally see his face, enjoy his presence and his fellowship without restriction and without interruption for eternity. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen.